This is Brandy, otherwise known as Mystery of Diamonds, and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, hey y'all. Okay, so I have on my gradient nails that I did for Frost Draggling because I am working on her. I'm finally on the final row. <gasps> oh, I cannot wait to be able to show you guys her completed. She is gorgeous. She's from Craftably. Um, so, uh, I am coming to you with another Forensic Friday. I know it's been a hot minute. Hopefully, my internet will let me actually get this up on Friday. I promise you it's being recorded on Friday, but we have storms going around here right now, and my internet already doesn't like me. Uh, so, hopefully, it will get up uh, on Friday. If it doesn't, then it'll get up on Saturday. Now, so the first thing, if you um, have not seen a Forensic Friday, the first thing that we start off with is I tell you the solution to the last episode's mystery. So what I'm going to do is I am going to link in the eye up here that uh, Forensic Friday because if you have not watched it and you don't want a spoiler, because I'm going to tell you the answer, then you might want to stop right now and go and watch that one so that you can hear what the mystery is um, before we get going. Okay, so I've given y'all all warning. Is everybody ready to hear the solution? We um, we had read the story, or I had read the, the mystery, um, where they said that they um, were sitting outside. So... Uh, the name of this uh, case was actually the case of the slow moving ducks. And so the solution is in the country around Lake Erie, in fact, in most of North America, no one would be able to sit out in their front yard in June at dusk during warm weather if they lived anywhere near a swamp. They would simply be eaten alive by mosquitoes. The witnesses with swamp on both sides of their front yard were certainly not likely to have been where they say they were. Because they said they were sitting outside at that time in that heat for um, a long period of time. And uh, they would not have been able to do that without getting eaten up by the skeeters. So... There is your solution. That's how we know that they were not telling the truth, that they did not see what they thought that they had saw. Okay, so the case that I'm going to talk about today, and usually the way I do this is, um, this first part is me talking and then I go through and um, I'll be doing, uh, working on this canvas and then I'm going to do a voiceover uh, about the forensic case and then I will read the next mystery. Okay, so the case that we're going to talk about today is the case of Scott and Lacey Peterson, okay? So technically, it's about Scott Peterson and what happened with Lacey Peterson. So I hope that y'all are ready, tuck in, and get ready for our forensic adventure. And then at the end, I will have the next mystery that I will read for you guys to solve and then next week i will tell you the solution so i hope that you guys are ready for another forensic friday because i really do enjoy doing them and i'm so glad that i'm able to get back to doing it so off to the story all right so this case um in my forensic textbook is considered the case of circumstantial evidence so it says on the surface scott peterson and his wife lacy appeared to live a happy and contented lifestyle in modesto california the 30 year old peterson and his 27 year old former college sweetheart the sub substitute teacher were expecting their first child in about one month when lacy suddenly disappeared scott told investigators that he had last seen his wife on december 24 2002 at 9 30 a.m when he left home for a fishing trip off San Francisco Bay. All right, so I'm kind of going to go through a little bit of the timeline before I continue the story. So December 24th, 2002, um, Lacey is reported missing. So she's uh, almost eight months pregnant at the time. Um, at about 9.30 that morning, um, Scott said he was leaving to go fishing. And so um, when they realized that she was missing, there was a huge manhunt. Um, that was uh, both regional and federal authorities and a volunteer search team 
um, that went out looking for her. However, uh, Scott actually took the brunt of the uh, scrutiny um, from investigators because they seemed he seemed like he didn't really have a, a concern really about his wife being missing um, with their you know being pregnant with his child and everything. Uh, he even refused to take a polygraph test. Um, then on January 24, 2003, uh, Amber Frey reveals that she had a relationship with Scott. Um, she was a massage therapist, and she said that she began dating Scott two months earlier from this disappearance. Um, she says she was completely unaware that he was married. Um, and so she contacted police on De uh, December 30th when she realized that there was a connection between her boyfriend and this missing woman that was in the um, headlines. Um, now, supposedly, um, he told this woman, he told Amber, um, that she, that his wife was already deceased. Um, and there was also some conflicting information about what he was doing the, the day that she was reported missing. Um, there's been a few little things that they found odd, like the fact that there was a candlelight vigil, uh, for Lacey being healed and he was, uh, seen laughing during it. Um, also before they found Lacey's body, um, he actually had sold off her car. Um, so, you know, they, they kind of like looked at this as, <clears throat> you know, wait a second, this is really suspicious behavior for someone who is supposedly innocent. Um, and so, uh, in March 5th, 2003, um, it, Lacey's case went from being a missing persons case to a homicide um, case. Now, uh, they haven't really given any reason specifically why at that point prior to her body being found that uh, she was now listed as a murder victim when they hadn't found the body yet. They don't really give any reasons for that. Um, other than they just had this, as they said, increasingly come to believe that Lacey is the victim of a violent crime. That's what the um, reports said. And then uh, April 13th to 14th of 2003, the remains of a woman and a fetus are found. Um, they're found on the shoreline of the San Francisco Bay. Um, so they found the body of the fetus. And then uh, a little ways away, they found uh, the decomposing body of a woman um, about two to three miles north of the uh, Berkeley Marina, the same place where Scott said that he went fishing um, that previous December. Um, they said that it's, uh, she, washed a sh blah, she washed ashore not far from where uh, Scott said he went fishing. And um, he actually claimed that Lacey was dressed in a white top and black pants when he last saw her. However, when her body was found, she was wearing khaki pants. Now, the thing is, is that Scott's sister actually recalled that the night before Lacey went missing, that she was seen wearing khaki pants. Um, yeah, all of a sudden, you know, now she's uh, dressed in something different. Um, and when Peterson was questioned, he claimed that he went fishing for sturgeon or striped bass. Um, however, when the police started investigating that, um, they noticed that he failed to bring any of the appropriate fishing uh, rod and lines in order to catch the fish that he stated that he went out to go fish uh, for. And then, of course, like I said, they found out about uh, this other relationship that he was having um, at the time that he was uh, married to Lacey. Um, they also found when they searched uh, a warehouse, a Scott's warehouse, they found a black hair, which Lacey's hair was black. 
They found a black hair on a pair of pliers that were resting uh, inside Scott's boat. And when they did a mitochondrial DNA uh, profile on the hair, uh, mitochondrial DNA is where they take it and they are looking for specific markers um, to uh, compare uh, the DNA profile. And uh, it was consistent with Lacey's DNA. Okay. Um, and one of the reasons you might go, well, how in the world? Because with mitochondrial DNA, let me just go ahead and say this. With mitochondrial DNA, um, they take a look at, like, the female relative. Um, so, like, Lacey's mom. And they look at the markers um, there, and then they compare it to the markers of the hair. And it is found to be um, where it would be uh, a daughter. And so, therefore, this would lead it to being consistent with Lacey's DNA. Um, and so April 18th, 2003, Scott is arrested and the bodies that were found washed up on shore are identified as Lacey and Connor, which is the, the name of the unborn child. Um, so Peterson is apprehended in La Jolla, California near um, the San Diego home of his mother and the Mexican border. Now, when they found him, he was going towards the Mexican border. He had dyed his hair and his goatee blonde. In his car, they found about $15,000 in cash. They found his brother's ID card and a lot of cell phones. Um, and it was later that day that they determined that those bodies found were... Uh, Lacey and Connor. Um, so then he goes to trial April 21st, 2003. Uh, in his trial, he pleads not guilty. Um, I think it's called Stanislaus County Superior Court, uh, where he was arraigned and he uh, pleads not guilty to two counts of capital murder. And he said he couldn't afford a lawyer, so therefore he needed a public defendant. Um, May 2nd, 2003, uh, a celebrity lawyer named Mark Garagos actually um, joined Scott's team to uh, represent him. Uh, November 18th, 2003 uh, is when, when he was ordered to stand trial. Um, so they had a preliminary hearing and um, that's when they determined, yes, there is enough cause to actually um, make him stand trial for double homicide. Um, in December 19, 2003, Lacey's mom actually uh, filed a wrongful death claim against um, Scott. Um, Lacey's mom was Sharon Rocha, um, and she filed a suit both as an individual and administer, uh, administrator of her daughter's estate. She was seeking more than $5 million in damages because she wants to make sure justice is done, whether it's in a civil court or a criminal court. Um, now, for a little while there, Lacey's mom had a really hard time actually believing that Scott could have done this, right? Um, you know, this is someone who uh, has been in the family, loved her daughter. Uh, she thought of as this really sweet, wonderful man. You know, there's no way that he, um, he could have done this, but then... Um, evidence started coming out in the trial, and so then she filed um, she filed this lawsuit. Um, January 20th, 2004, the trial is moved to San Mateo County because there was this overwhelmingly, uh, there, there was a lot of publicity about the case. There was a lot of hostility, and so therefore, um, they believed Scott's um, defendant, the, or Scott's the defense attorneys, excuse me, the defense attorneys decided that there was no way that he could get a fair trial in his hometown. So what they did was they transferred the trial about 90 miles away to San Mateo County. Um, so June 1st, 2004 was when his trial began. Um, so they start out with the opening statements um, and the prosecution said that, you know, Scott was wanting a responsibility-free life. 
Uh, so what he did was he took his wife and his unborn child out on the boat and he killed them and dumped them and weighted her body in the bay. And, you know, that's when they washed ashore later. Um, and, of course, um, his his demeanor, I guess, when he was questioned, um, you know, he never once got upset like where's like during the time when she was missing before she was ever found. You know, he never once was like, where's Lacey? Where's my wife? Where's my baby? Where's, you know, what's going on? Someone find her. Like, no, like her parents were. They went on TV. Uh, they begged and pleaded for whoever had Lacey to please return Lacey um, unharmed. Um, please give them back their daughter and their soon to be grandchild. Um, Scott, however, had demonstrated none of um, that. Then, uh, June 23rd, 2004, they actually had to remove a juror um, because the juror, Justin Falconer, uh, was spotted speaking to Lacey's brother outside the courtroom. And so, therefore, because of that, because they're not supposed to, the jurors are not supposed to uh, talk to uh, members of the family or you know, anybody that's involved in the case, um, because it could unfairly taint their viewpoints. Um, now, with that being said, then the defense team tried to get the case uh, thrown out as a mistrial. Um, however, the um, judge shot that down, and he's like, look, you know, I know there's a lot of media, but we have to live with the media. I'm sorry. That's, you know, no matter where we go, and they had also contemplated moving it again for a second time, and they said, no, listen, no matter where we go, there's going to be publicity. This is a very public, high-profile case, okay? There's there's going to be publicity. There's not really a lot that we can do about that. Um, then August 10th, 2004, Amber Frey, which was, um, you know, the the mistress, um, actually took the, took the stand. Um, and, you know, she talks about her first date with Scott, um, like, she remembers it being like a fairy tale and uh, she even tells, you know, people, it tells the jury and the judge, you know, look, he gave me all these claims. He said he was a widower, widower um, and that, you know, he just, he was desperately sad and, he, you know, he, he missed uh, his dead wife and, and whatnot. Um, they even had 12 hours of re recorded phone calls from uh, Scott to uh, Fry, and so that actually was a huge shift for the prosecution, okay, because now you had this uh, information where you actually have his voice speaking to her um, and all of that, and so then in October 21st, 2004, um, the defense's medical expert fumbles while he's on the stand. So, you know, usually what happens is you have the prosecutor and the defense, um, the prosecution and the defense both have medical experts, okay? And so what happens is you're trying to show the jury where your medical, your person um, has, the you know, more knowledge, um, can show uh, a different viewpoint, so to speak. Um, and so they they called on their, the defense called on their medical expert, and he indicated that Lacey was still alive after she was reported missing. Um, however, the appearance ends badly because he concedes that he didn't actually, that he actually relied on hearsay to pinpoint the date of the pregnancy test and not um, by looking at any medical data. And at one point, he was like, please just cut me some slack. I mean, you know, like, so that was also a huge point for the prosecution when you can debunk or, you know, throw suspicion uh, on an expert testimony. Then November 3rd, 2004, the jury deliberated. Um, I mean, they had had about 180 witnesses. Guys, that's a lot of witnesses uh, going up on the stand. Um, another juror, uh, Fran Gorman, is dismissed for uh, misconduct um, because they later found out that um, she was conducting separate research. 
Um, so therefore, she was replaced by an alternate, Rochelle Nice. Um, however, that, you know, also turned into something a little bit later down the road during the appeals section. Um, and then another foreman, Gregory Jackson, um, is removed because supposedly he asked to be removed because he was having issues with fellow jurors and it was causing uh, a disruption during them. So then November 12, 2004, Scott is found guilty. Now, they had no um, murder weapon. They didn't have any physical evidence that was tying Scott to Lacey and the baby. Um, what they had was circumstantial evidence, but there was a lot of circumstantial evidence that kind of pointed towards this. And so, therefore, he was found guilty of first-degree murder of his wife, Lacey, and second-degree murder for the death of Connor, the baby. Um, and then uh, December 13th, 2004, the jury recommended the death sentence. It took 11 hours of deliberation. Um, and it was a six-man, six-woman jury, and they unanimously voted to fix the penalty at death. So March 16, 2005, the judge sentences Scott to death by lethal injection. Um, and there was a lot of emotion when Lacey's family uh, actually asked, because there is a point in the punishment phase um, where... Uh, the victim's family uh, has an opportunity sometimes if they want to, to uh, speak um, before the penalty phase. And so they're given the opportunity to speak um, and, you know, they're both yelling and Lacey's brother tells Scott that, you know, he strongly considered shooting him. And all this while, Scott just kind of sits there, you know, just kind of stares at him. He doesn't say anything back to them. He doesn't offer a response. Nothing. Um, and then he shipped off to San Quentin State Prison. Um, April 2009, Lacey's family decided to drop the charges um, of the wrongful death claim. Um, they don't really say exactly why they decided to drop that, but they did. So then in July 5th, 2012, Scott files an appeal. Because even if you have been convicted, you do sometimes have the appeal process where um, a lot of times, especially if you continue to claim your innocence, uh, you might can, uh, appeal and hope to maybe be able to get a new trial or whatnot. Um, and so what they were trying to argue was that Scott did not receive a fair trial. Okay. Um, because when they were going through the jury selection uh what the defense is saying is that the prosecution literally let people go from the jury because when they're choosing their jury they get an opportunity to ask questions or have them answer a questionnaire and if and there were jurors that said that they uh would not vote for the uh death penalty or they don't believe in the death penalty those people were dismissed and so therefore um they feel that it was unfair so that's why they feel they uh filed the appeal um and then november 24 2015 scott filed a second appeal um it pretty much covers the same thing as the first appeal with one other uh little maybe not so little kind of a big uh, difference is that he revealed that Nice, one of those late trial uh, replacements in the jury, had actually lied. She lied about the fact that she had been involved herself in legal proceedings because when she was pregnant, she was threatened by her boyfriend's ex-girlfriend. So therefore, you know, she had been pregnant, she had been uh, threatened, and her baby's life had been threatened, and she had excluded and lied about that information. And so he figured that this was another, you know, you already you had a juror that was preconditioned against him, and so that was um, reasoning for the second appeal. Um, so August twenty fourth, two thousand twenty, y'all, this is still going in two thousand twenty. Scott's death sentence is overturned. Um, they believed that, yes, 
the prospective jurors were um, improperly dismissed for their opposition to the death penalty, um, but they still had a willingness to adhere to it. And so the Supreme Court overturned, the California Supreme Court overturned the death sentence. Now, what they did is that they still said, they, they said, listen, we still believe that you got a fair trial, and so therefore we are upholding the murder conviction. So in other words, you're getting an opportunity to get a new penalty phase, okay, uh, where he's going to get a new trial to be able to see, um, like, he's still being convicted. He's still being convicted of both counts of murder. The, the difference is, is he's being retried on the penalty phase, whether he gets the death penalty or whether he gets life in prison without parole, um, whatnot. Um, so October 14th, 2020, um, his convictions are re-examined based off of, they focused on presidential, uh, prejudicial, sorry, misconduct due to that woman nice failing to disclose um, her thing. And so now they sent it to San Mateo County Superior Court to determine whether there was going to be a new trial. So October 23rd, 2020, prosecutors announced plans to pursue the same course of action. In other words, they are seeking to, to get the death penalty for him again. Um, they believe that they'll be able to, or, you know, what they're hoping is that once, you know, even though the death penalty got, uh, overturned, they're hoping to get it since they're getting a new trial for the penalty phase. Now, this doesn't just mean that so you're getting a whole new set of jurors and they're coming in and they're going to have to look at all the evidence again. And what the defense is hoping is that when they're looking at all the new, uh, or all the evidence and everything, it would show his innocence and maybe therefore be able to get an entirely new trial and not just for the penalty phase but for the guilty phase as well um november 6 2020 scott did not want a speedy trial he you know he turned down his choice for a speedy trial he um was in a superior court hearing via zoom and he waived the right of a speedy trial of the penalty phase because he's really hoping that by giving them enough time um, to find more evidence or redefine evidence that he will get an entirely new trial which will find him not guilty versus guilty. So this was one that they didn't have a ton of physical evidence. Most of it was circumstantial evidence that... Uh, when it gets him. Um, so at this present time, he is, uh, he is no longer on death row, but he is still in San Quentin, um, in prison. And, uh, he is, they are currently still trying to, um, go through the retrial, presumably for the penalty phase, but there is still that possibility that he could completely get a new trial. Um, so we'll just have to see. I mean, that's, that's, that's been a long time ago that this happened. Um, but, you know, it just kind of shows that just because uh, a crime uh, happened a while back doesn't mean that there's not still appeals and other things that happened. So that was the case of or what we know so far of Scott and Lacey Peterson case. So are you guys ready for the next mystery? Okay, so let's get to the next mystery. So remember, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the mystery to you, and you're going to comment in the comments below what you believe the answer to this mystery is. Okay, so here we go. When the 14th run-through failed as badly as the first, Sinksop yielded to a rare admission of total defeat. Sinksop, which is Commander-in-Chief, Foreign Dignitary Security Operations Procedures, C-I-N-C-F-D-S-O-P, was Desmond Malquis Carver. Junior personnel called him Mr. Carver, sir. He'd have preferred Colonel, but that was officially frowned upon. Agents with seniority called him Sir. 
no one addressed him in the familiar except for gordon pate who called him des and once sink but that was another story an ex-military man like the rest of the sdsop branch carver was accustomed to success and what he had been watching did nothing for his or anyone else's sense of well-being there has to be a way there just has to be he looked at his watch then slapped the table this meeting's over go get something to eat we'll reconvene at 1900 hours no 1905 i'll be in my office he stood up quickly up too quickly as it turned out because when the crisis team jumped to their feet with him they knocked the apparatus flying two of them grabbed for the squash balls another dropped to his knees hurriedly to retrieve the little weights that had fallen onto the floor carver paid no attention he kicked a tiny one gram weight into the corner and walked out slamming the door even before the sound faded he reopened it one of you bring pate he commanded they nodded in unison in the comfort of his office desmond carver took off his tie and dropped into a chair beneath the picture of a young lieutenant grinning beside the burned out hull of a north korean tank he longed for korea again it was so simple then he thought hq would say take the hill so you shelled it you led your men up you took it then he led them back down and on to the next one a bit like the grand old duke of york he said to himself with a grin but still a lot better than this crisis nonsense today the nonsense today was the general happiness unfettered comfort and absolute security of his esteemed excellency Xiao Lang Ding, Minister of Justice, squash enthusiast, and most likely successor to the premiership of the People's Republic of China. What made it nonsense to Carver was not the person of Xiao Lang Ding, who had proven himself to be urbane, pleasant, and cooperative. It was the way in which he had to be protected. Chow had to be looked after, no question about that, but it was never to appear that way. It must never appear to anyone, even Chow, that he required protection. Otherwise, he would lose face. Yet, FDSOP rated the man Category 7. Even the Queen of England was only Category 5. The crisis part of tomorrow morning's squash game between Chow and the President. That game, unless FDSOP could prevent it, was going to turn into a diplomatic incident of major consequence. While the president was a top-flight squash player, there was no doubt that Chow would win. He was world-class. That part was all right, however. In fact, the State Department preferred it so. After all, this was squash, not baseball or golf. As long as the president gave Chow a good run, he didn't have to win. The problem, the crisis, was sabotaged equipment. An FDSOP agent had attained incontroversial evidence that one of the squash balls they were to use was ever so slightly, but quite deliberately, weighted on one side. It would bounce just a bit off center, just a bit off truth, and make both the president and child look like fools in front of hordes of media. A jouncing tap on the door startled Carver. Gordon Pate does, a cheerful voice announced. Not here. The me The door opened then closed, and Gordon Pape had taken a seat before Carver was even sure what he had been going to say. Heard you needed me, Pape smiled, and proceeded to dangle his leg comfortably over the arm of his chair. He was oblivious to CINCFDSOP's fixation with protocol. The squash game? Carver willed himself to be calm. Gordon Pape was the only non-military type in the branch. He was irrelevant and irrepressible, but simply the best agent they had. How thoroughly have you been briefed, Carver asked, addressing himself to the desk blotter. The dangling leg was just too much for him. Well, I know all about the game, if that's what you mean, Pape said, but so does the whole world. The rest of it I'm pretty sketchy on. All I know is that they might be playing with a wonky ball and that would make them both look dumb. I got that from the new kid of yours with the funny haircut. That new kid, Carver's glare was focused this time, is a former Marine and the haircut is regulation. Gordon Pape shifted in his chair so that he could dangle his other leg over the arm as well. Carver cleared his throat. The matter, plain and simple, is that we have to replace one bad squash ball with a normal one. For the first time, Pape sat up straight. I suppose, he said, it's not just a simple case of palming the bad one replacing it, is it? No, Carver replied. Number one, the squash balls, including the sabotaged ones, are being supplied by Chow. Heavy symbolism here. After the game, there's going to be a new trade agreement signed. 
Among other things, China is going to sell us sports equipment. Ape whistled in appreciation of the situation. Number two, they're already on display in Chow's suit. Have been ever since he arrived. You'd never be allowed to touch them. Besides, there are eight. You could never check that many without being obvious. Number three, our information is that you can't tell the bad one from the good one by feel or appearance anyway, even by picking it up. So nobody knows which one it is. Pape was becoming seriously interested. All we know, Carver leaned forward, is that it weighs a few milligrams more than it should. I see, Pape murdered, murmured. Is there any good news? There's one piece of sheer luck. Chow is very proud of being Minister of Justice. Last year, the Canadian government gave him a balance scale in 24 karat gold. You know, the blind justice statue. It was a real working scale, and he just loves it. Takes it everywhere he goes, and makes sure it's always out where everybody can see it. Pape was leaning forward now. This means you've got the equipment right there. Why don't you just send somebody in to do the job? For a long time, Desmond Malquis Carver held his breath. Maybe, he said. Maybe uh, you can help us here. He swallowed. State has asked for the privilege of carrying the balls from Chow's suit to the court. The Chinese have agreed. They're flattered, in fact. That means I can get one of our people in wearing a gymnasium attendance uniform. Even if they frisk him, which I doubt, one squash ball in his pocket's going to look normal enough. The problem is time. We've been at it all afternoon with a duplicate of Chow's scale. At the absolute outside, our agent has got time to use the scale for only two weights. Now, how does he find that ringer using the scale only twice? Pape turned his turn to lift his leg over the arm of the chair again and allowed himself to slip down comfortably. You've done a lot of homework, Des, he said with genuine admiration. Now, do you want me to be the attendant tomorrow morning, or have you got someone else in mind? Gordon Pape has a solution. What is it? Do you think you know? Tell me in the comments. All right, now on to the end of the video. Okay, so this is where I'm going to leave you. I still have quite a lot of these Fs to have to place, but I hope that you enjoyed the case of Scott Peterson and, you know, at least learning about it. And I hope that you enjoyed our little mystery. Do you think you know the answer? Make sure that you comment down below what you think the answer to the mystery is. I so do uh, enjoy love the uh, see if I can't talk. I do so enjoy doing these, so I am going to be getting back to doing them. I hope that y'all have enjoyed this. If you did, please hit that thumbs up button down below. And if you haven't subscribed, I would love for you to subscribe and become part of my Diamonds family. We love to have you here. Come on. Just make sure that you hit that bell notification anytime for all notifications because that'll let you know anytime I upload a video or whenever I go live, which is usually on Mondays at 7 o'clock Central Time. So I have Sapphire here. Sapphire and I are going to say goodbye for now. So I'm going to leave you like I always do. Reach for the stars. Grab hold. Hold on. And never let go. Until my next video. Bye guys.